This week on CrossFeed, goats on a plane, a chaplain prayed to Jesus. Is he for real? Is yoga religious? Is that a rabbit in your hat or an AK-47? And can congressmen confess their faith? Everybody. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. And welcome you all back after a week break. I'm Dr. Jim Butler, pastor of St. Luke Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. So it is good to see you again, my friend. Yep, good to see you. This, uh... This episode is probably going to come out on Sunday, so if people are expecting it before that, I apologize, but I'm going on a little bit of a trip just this weekend, and uh, so I'm going to end up editing and posting this after we get back. So we're going to Adventureland. Oh. In it's an amusement park in uh, Altoona, Iowa, down by Des Moines. That sounds fun used to be when we went to Adventureland, we'd always have to go to West Des Moines to the Apple Store. But now there's an Apple Store in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, that's a lot closer, and I've got family up there, so we can just stop at the Apple Store on the way to visit family. So. I have an Apple Store three cool. miles away from my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get tired of going there. Went there the other day with my, my son, who's in the Army, and... He bought himself a uh, brand new iPod, uh, the ones that just came out, the iPod Classic. And, the classic? Okay. Yeah, which is, puts mine to shame. And then he bought a uh, 13-inch MacBook. Hmm. And he got a military discount. Nice. I could use one of those. So, um, join the Army. You'll get a military discount, too. <laughs> yeah. Well... <laughs> Yeah, that or if you can, you know, argue you're using it to teach somehow, you can get the educational discount. Yeah. Yeah, except you have to be affiliated with a school for that, and I'm not. Yeah. Buy it in your children's name. I am your father. That's an interesting idea. I think you actually have to be affiliated, though. For, with Apple, because I've looked into that before. I've been able to buy software in my kid's name from some companies, but um, we tried to get a, a computer that way, and it didn't work. Mm. It, you actually, they need to know, you have to be like a teacher or something like that, or else it's um, it's uh, like a college or something like that. Okay. My kids aren't in college yet. I bought mine through when my... Uh, um, Working at uh, Concordia, Bronxville, and doing my college level courses there, I was able to do it. And uh, then the other time I needed to buy one, <clears throat> I uh, happened to be um, the vacancy pastor at a church that had a school, K K to eight school, and uh, they said that was the, that they bought that one too. So those were my connections. But we need to move on here. and yep. um, A computer is cheaper than buying a new 757. Yes. Hey, well, I, I, that's a nice way. Although, if your computer breaks down, do you burn a goat to get it running? I usually just call tech support. Yeah, that's right. I Maybe it out myself. Yeah, and obviously, you know, this is Nepal Airlines, not Southwest. Um, you know, <laughs> Anyway, I thought this was kind of an interesting article. Uh, yeah, this is in Nepal. Uh, their state-run airline. There was something that wasn't working, right? And so uh, they sacrificed two goats to Akash Biribe. Probably mispronounced that. Uh, the Hindu sky god. Yeah, and for some reason, it the worked, and they flew on their way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, when I when I see a, a, a plane, you know, that's malfunctioning or something like that, I'm thinking call a mechanic, a technician, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But uh, Captain Robert Norris, a former United Airlines pilot for 30 years who's gone climbing in Nepal, says it's not that usual, that not that unusual to see a sacrifice going on. We may say a small prayer ourselves when we take off. It's just part of their culture. You know, we say a prayer, they sacrifice a goat. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. So, uh, so you placate the god and then, uh, well, you know, it's, it's sort of like um, uh, saying a prayer to St. Christopher. Are you incapable of restraining yourself? Who's the Jesuits have proven that he never existed. Or do you take pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? Although, my, my, my favorite comment is um, this visiting scholar at the University of Virginia who's flown to Paul Airlines before said, maybe one of the be- most effective things they've ever done to fix their planes. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of sad, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, apparently there was, uh, some, some, they have some real problems with these 757s. So they don't keep them in real good shape. And uh, they've had a lot of problems with them. But as long as you got to stay goat blood around. <laughs> I guess you're doing okay. <laughs> you know, you know I, the thing is, we kind of joke about this as Americans and, and as Christians, but really the, the thing that kind of stuck out with this for me is the whole idea of having to appease a god. Mm-hmm. You know, well, we have to perform these sacrifices to appease the God. This is very different from, for instance, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, which were not to appease God. It wasn't to make their crops grow or anything like that. That was what Baal worship was. Um, it was all about getting your crops to grow. But um, really, the reason they performed these sacrifices was for the forgiveness of their sins, mm-hmm. which, and really, it wasn't so much... It wasn't, here are our goats to sacrifice to you. It's, God, you have given us this to us, and we know that you're going to take care of us, and, and we are going to sacrifice these goats on our behalf. And the whole point of it was to point to the coming Messiah who shed his blood on behalf of the people for the forgiveness of their sins. So it's very, very different concept right. as, um, know, than <clears throat> appeasing to make Yeah, of course, Hummel, when I was at St. Louis Seminary, said, they really weren't as much a sacrifice as really a sacrament. They were really were a, what we in Lutherans would call a means of grace. And God really touched the people's lives and he forgave them in that. Mm-hmm. It really was a, a, a gift of forgiveness given. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of sad that, you know, the, this idea that, you know, that, that these gods are going to be mean. These gods are going to, if you don't appease them and make them happy, they'll, you know, they'll break, make the plane break down or they'll slap the plane out of the sky or... Um, something like that and it's kind of neat to you know it, it, but that's not our problem you know i just did a funeral today and how nice it was for me to be able to talk about how christ you know gave his life for this guy and this guy had this wonderful servant heart and i talked about how you know he was a servant he was a servant following a servant lord you know a lord who served him and therefore you know, he also was now the servant and you know it's just completely different than this idea of having to be scared and worried about what the gods are going to do. Yep. Yep. I have a member of my congregation is, um, uh, well, he's dying and it's no secret. Um, and it's, he's got cancer and he knows that his time is very short. And, uh, he says, I'm ready. You know, he has no fear and, you know, his family's upset, obviously. And, um, and he says, yeah, but you know, Look what I have to look forward to. Mm-hmm. You know, right now he's in pain and, you know, he's, he's frustrated and, um, you know, he knows he's going to heaven. So, and he knows that without a doubt. So he's, you know, he has nothing to fear. He's, you know, he's anxious and, uh, you know, anxious to go, not anxious mm-hmm. about his condition. Um, he doesn't want to be in pain. But, I mean, his family's saying, well, yeah, that's, you know, that's great for you, but well, we're going to miss you. Right. I had a member one time, and he uh, he got the, the day he got the news he was going to die, and it was his wife was there and his daughter was there, and, and he he looked at him and he said, "I'm not scared. He says, I know where I'm going. I'm, I'm going, you know, straight to heaven. I got a one way ticket to the Lord." He says, "But he says I hurt for you because you're going to miss me and you're going to be in pain and you're going to you're going to be in sorrow without me here, and you know, I'm hurting for you." He says, "Don't cry for me." But he says, I'm going to be crying for you. 
Yeah. And I thought that was really neat that he really had that, that, that type of idea that, you know, I'm going to be with the Lord. You're going to be with the pain. And there's nothing I can do to make that any better. Right. Um, but, yeah. but that's the assurance of the resurrection. Yeah. Because I was also talking to his family, and they said, they said, you know what? We know that this isn't the end. We know we're going to see him again. And so it's okay. It's going to be all right. Now, when they pray, though, do you think they pray in the name of the goat? Uh. <laughs> and if they were chaplains, would they pray in goat name? <laughs> and if they did, would they get fired for it? <laughs> I have no idea what that meant. We have a, a Florida chaplain. says he was fired from his position for including the word Jesus at the end of his prayers. His name is Danny Harvey, Reverend Danny Harvey. I worked for the Leesburg Regional Center for more than seven years. And uh, he says he was forced to resign from this post for using Jesus' name when he was praying. There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. I, I, I was wondering how you, you're forced to resign. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Well... They can make things extremely uncomfortable for you. Uh, I guess. I mean, uh, you know, which, you know, I, I'm not sure about that, but um, or we're going to cut your pay so much that you can't afford to work here anymore. It could be something like that. I'm not sure. Now, I mean, it, it's hard because this is one of those he said he said. I mean, the the you know the. The, the CEO of the hospital saying, well, no, if it was a Christian family, we had no trouble with this, but he was apparently doing this with Jewish families and Hindu families and, and others, and, um, you know, and, and, and that was that would be, uh, um, you know, a problem. But he's saying, well, no, I asked them, can I pray for you? And, you know, they always have the option of saying no. Uh, mm-hmm. But maybe I don't. I don't know. I, it's it's hard without being there to know exactly what was going on. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a this is a tricky thing though because, and and it's it's not not being a chaplain and not having training as a chaplain, it's kind of hard to say. But it, it's got to be extremely difficult for um, for chaplains who are dealing with people that are not Christians, because I mean what message of comfort can you give? And, you know, for me, anytime somebody's suffering, the only message of comfort that I know how to give is to tell them about Jesus. And, I mean, I I don't know how to handle, you know, otherwise, kind of the best you can do is say, well, you know, hope you feel better. That was pointless. And, you know, for that matter, if he's offering a prayer for them, wouldn't, you know, it's understood that he is a Christian. And so obviously he's not praying to, um, you know, Ganesh or, you know, some other God. He's praying to the Christian God. And so... And normally, normally, if you're dealing with somebody who is Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or, or whatever, uh, one of the things you would do is try to contact a chaplain of that faith, uh, you right. know, and, and at, or, or you know, somebody to come in and local pastor, a or local or local priest or rabbi or whatever you you, you know, but uh, you got, yeah. Sometimes, you? though, you know, as a chaplain, you, you, you have to deal with this, and you, you almost deal with it more of the mental health professional point of view. Now, I've yeah. never, you know, I, I knew one hospital chaplain. He, he shared with me. I, I talked to a, a um, Navy chaplain who was assigned to a Marine Corps over in uh, uh, Desert Shield, and he said, you know, he was, he was telling me things about that, and, you know, he talked about, you know, and meet the guys and go, I'm no religious preference, sir. Well, that's good. I'm the no religious preference chaplain, you know. 
You know, I'm I'm your chaplain. I'm here for you, regardless whether or not you you know think you believe anything. And um, he he said, you know, one other branch of the armed forces had you know therapists and counselors and chaplains and all kinds of stuff. And he's with you know over I think he said like you know five six hundred Marines, and he was the only one. Oh yeah. So you know you you, you do try to you know handle it from such partly from a mental health professional viewpoint. Um, because that's just... Although he did tell me he did do some baptisms over there. And he figured... Oh, yeah, yeah this, was in, so, this was in Kuwait and and stuff. And he figured, uh, you know, probably no Christian baptism been done in those waters in centuries. Yeah. So, yeah. But chaplaincy, I think, is very difficult because of that, because you do have to do a plurality. Um, I know within, again, the armed forces, I know the rule is is um, sometimes if, if you've got a group of Wiccans, you know, you don't have to leave the service, you, but you just have to find them a room where they can go do it. You know, that's kind of, you yeah. know, or you have a group of Jehovah's Witnesses, you just need to find a room where they can go do whatever they want to do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you don't necessarily have to lead it or, or watch it or anything if you disagree with it. Um, I think it's difficult then too. You know, he's a hospital chaplain. Okay, well, this is the person who you know isn't where I'm coming from, but now, but I have to deal with them because they're here and they want some mm-hmm. sort of comfort right now. What can I do for them? What, how can I bring them in? And and it's you know that's part of uh, CPE, clinical pastoral education. How do I bring in the things of my um, theological background and and apply it to this situation with sensitivity, but yet at the same time with integrity. Right. So it's 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 a bit of a yeah. Not an easy I think thing. It, it, you know, it needs to be understood that if you are going to um, to say a prayer for someone, you know, offer a prayer, um, that it, it needs to be understood that you're going to pray to your God. Um. But yeah, I mean, how you how exactly you handle that. Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. I don't know. And I mean, I'm assuming that he wasn't, that wasn't, you know, I'm assuming that he was doing whatever sort of counseling kind of things or, or whatever, too. But, so. yeah, and it's hard to say, you know, I mean, he says, you know, they forced him to resign and, and you know, would that be the only thing? You know, hey, you do everything else excellent, but you know, you do this, you know, pray in the name of Jesus thing, we, we, you know, that we're gonna, that's gonna be a black mark on you, or were there other issues? It's, it's hard unless you're there to, to make the, the judgment. Yeah. Um, but, it, I mean, it, it doesn't, from the article at least, there's no indication that there were any other factors. Right. Any monkey business is ill advised. Um, but it's, it says that, his services were not consistent with the center's various faiths. So, right. yeah, it's really hard to know what the whole story is. And I looked around for more information on this. And even the original article that was posted at Crossfeed uh, ended up getting pulled. And we had to find it at Fox News. And there's no other articles about it that I could find anywhere else to get more information. So, this is just basically from one... Uh, Source. From one Florida source. Okay, but what if he was running for Congress in Louisiana? Yeah. Now, that's, well, pretty much the same thing. (laughs) You know, would that cause, would he get in trouble for doing that? Yeah. Especially if he was Roman Catholic. Yes. Now, and a former Hindu. And for me, there you go. Who's not Roman Catholic? We've full circle already. Yeah. <laughs> We're not even through them all. Uh, Bobby Jindal, who is leading in the governor's race, last I heard by like 50 points, okay? I mean, he's overwhelmingly winning. Um, he's a Republican. Yeah, he's a Republican. And the Democrats are not very happy at all. And uh, they put out a website on Bobby Jindal on religion. And that, you know, 
accuses him of calling Protestants scandalous, depraved, selfish, and heretical. Oh, good grief. And uh, I was just absolutely shocked at what they um, what they wrote. And what I was really shocked by was when I was reading the actual papers. It, it, there's, a, there's a website, and I maybe you could put the website up on the screen so people can go to it if they want to. But, I mean, he, he's a Roman Catholic. He's a very conservative Roman Catholic. Um, and, you know, he, I thought what he wrote made perfect sense from a Roman Catholic viewpoint. A matter of fact, Catholic viewpoint. Exactly. He, but he, I mean, even though he just, they took stuff out of um, context. I mean, because when he talks about Protestants being depraved, he refers to what John Calvin said. And that's exactly what Calvin says. That's exactly what Lutherans <laughs> say. That, yeah, apart from Christ, we are totally depraved. And Roman Catholics are semi-Pelagian, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they don't quite see it that way. There is evil there. You know, as I, as I like to, you know, phrase it in my confirmation class, we say people are blind, dead, and enemies of God. They, uh, you know, uh, um, and whereas classic Roman Catholic theology would say, instead of being blind, dead, and enemies of God, we need glasses, we don't feel so good, and we just don't like God very much. <laughs> that's actually pretty accurate, I think. You know, I mean, that's, you know, and um, it, but, you know, I just Reading what he what what they wrote, I, I just I was just could not believe it. Uh, yeah, well, you know, you take stuff out of context. The other thing is, you know, he wrote all this stuff before he was um, involved in politics. Which, you know, if he had, I imagine if he had known that he had, was going into politics, that he probably would have been a little more um, diplomatic um, about what he wrote. But you know, what it comes down to is everything that that's there from and I didn't read all of it and some of the articles are you have to subscribe to that particular paper um in order to be able to read them and I didn't want to pay to subscribe to the paper just to read a couple articles but um it's pretty consistent with Roman Catholic teachings right you know so it's it's sort of like when they what was it a while back that they um blasted uh Romney because of the Mormon Church's uh, old position on um, on blacks and and their sort of definition of where black skin came from and stuff like that and you know or or, or there was that um, there's that that story that we covered about that woman in Minnesota that she was a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran yes and that uh, that Lutherans believe the Pope's the Antichrist. And so they made this huge, oh, you believe that? You know, it's, uh, but she, she actually backed down. Right. Whereas this is stuff that he's not apologizing for it, right. but he's going, come on. And I, I most likely she probably never knew that was the position of the Wisconsin Synod and doesn't know if that's the position of the Book of Concord, which you may, may or may not want to agree with anyway, but, you know, I mean, you know, and, but, you know, the, and to try to, you know, sometimes trying to nuance some of the theological stuff, it gets a little hard. Right, you know, especially and, in a political ad. Right. You know, especially when it's an attack ad. Yeah, you know, I like this, I like this one guy down there, um, you know, this one, one Democrat says, hey, he needs to quit squealing about the attack ads. You know, um. He jeopardizes my ability to effectively govern this student body. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't mind. Attack. I don't like attack ads, but politics, politics. But you got to draw the line somewhere. And I say, yeah. you know, attacking somebody's um, uh, 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 religious thoughts or thoughts on, you know, on how religion has affected his life. I mean, and of course he's going to be extremely devout. I mean, he became he was Hindu and became Roman Catholic. He, you know, made a conscious decision. Um, and you know. People who are converts tend to be a little bit more um, zealous in their their faith. Yeah, sure. Because I mean, for them, it's this isn't just well, yeah, I was born and raised this way, yada yada yada. You know, they don't take it for granted because this is 
this is a major event in their life. So, yeah, this is, like, you know you're getting desperate when you take, you know, their religious beliefs out of context and, uh, and attack them. All right. Especially when so, some, some of the things that he said were, are, are an accurate reflection of the people he's talking about. That was the yeah. thing I got is really, you know, I was going, well, this is exactly what Calvin believed. Or I can't remember some of the other things that, you know, they took out of context, but that's exactly what the guy believed. Yeah. You know, uh, 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 you know you, or, you know, you know, that, you know, with this position that he has here, this is the position of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, this is what Rome has always upheld. Now, what's yeah. your problem, people? Yeah, so kudos to um, uh, Mr. Jindal mm -hmm. for um, for actually sticking to his faith. And, and for, you know, what bothers me is when you have people that claim that they're members of a particular <laughs> faith but don't actually believe the teachings of that church. Yeah. That you mean like Ted Kennedy? Are you a God-fearing man, Senator? Well, I'm not going to, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I will. Oh, I mean, um, he's my son, John Kerry. Uh, they both claim to be Catholic. I think all Kennedy's mistresses did too, as far as that goes. But you know, <laughs> so you know that's uh, that's that's a lot of East Coast stuff too. You know, that's not as close to home for me. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, I can, yeah, I can, I can insult Ted Kennedy all day. It's so easy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but if Bobby Jindal had worn a turban, would they still want to check him out? I don't know. Dindy's He's don't new. wear turbans, but um, this is an interesting some new federal guidelines. Yeah, um, that travelers to. Um, basically, if you're wearing some kind of head covering, whether it be a cowboy hat, a beret, or a turban, um, then you could have a pat-down search of the head covering if the screener finds it necessary. Right. If, if, if there's something that, for some reason, you know, the screener believes it, 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 it's uh, um, covering something up or something, but... Um, and the New York-based Sikh coalition says they really think this singles out Sikhs and others who wear religious head coverings, uh, which would be uh, Muslim women and other groups. And cowboys. And, yeah, but it says, uh, you know, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and the Asian American Justice Center, uh, you know, are, aren't too happy about this. Um, and they said they've already have, uh, the Sikhs have already said 40 incidents uh, in the last month, where Sikhs were subjected to these these searches. Help! Help! I'm being repressed! And it, they can lead to profiling. Says, some of the travelers were not offered a private area for screening. It doesn't say they were denied a private area for screening. It says they weren't offered it. In other words, and it's, it says some, which could be three. Um, but, it you know... It, it could have been that they didn't request it. Yeah. So we don't have that information. Now, I, I confess, I don't know much about Sikhism. You know, for them, you know, they, the guy says it would be like asking a woman to take off her blouse in public. Uh. You know, for them to remove their turban. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very private thing. Um, I know within, obviously, the Muslim culture, you know, for women to, to remove... You know, they're, they're a head covering and stuff. But I said it's supposed to only take place if they don't pass a metal detector. You know. Um, and then it actually, it says, sub, it could include a pat-down search. I, I don't see anything in here about actually being forced to remove it. Unless I missed that. But I, I don't, I think it's, it's just a pat-down search. So, well, gee, you're... Um, you know, your head didn't pass a metal detector test. Uh, we'd like to know what you have under that hat. Right. I mean, do, do, do they do the wand first? The wand chooses the wizard. 
I would think so. You know, then and, and you know, and they, you know, have the wand go over you and stuff, and you know, then they find out ah, well, you gotta, you know, I mean, you know, it goes off by your belt. Well, they don't need you to move your hat then because it's going off down by your belt, and you know, won't shake the right. belt off and try it again. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what is it? What's going on? Uh, you know, I again, I I hate. I hate being somebody in the TSA and having to make these decisions. Yeah. You know, and then have... You know, otherwise anybody could just stick anything. I mean, if people are, are willing to hide stuff, like, inside the sole of their shoes, I mean, man, anybody can hide something under a hat. You know? <laughs> hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. <laughs> <laughs> I got through airport security with it. Uh, that trick never works. I think I ought to buy another hat. I'm... You know what I want to do? Run away! I want to make it against Lutheran teaching to take off my shoes in the airport. There you go. Because I really hate walking around stocking footed. I think everybody else in the airport would appreciate it if you didn't take your shoes off there, too. <laughs> Probably true, but you know, but you know, I mean, I think if I could, you know, just make that a, you know, a thing. It's a, yeah, my my religion doesn't allow me to take my shoes off in public. You know? My religion doesn't allow me to take off my overcoat in public. Yeah, you know, I got news for you. It's um, uh, we all we all have things there that we have to deal with, and I, you know, again, I think they need to approach this, this issue with sensitivity. You know, I mean, if, if the, the turban is that, 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 that important, you know, I mean, they said, you know, it's like asking a woman to remove her blouse. So obviously you wouldn't do that. Uh, right. so, you know, I mean, again, you need to treat with sensitivity. And I, I hope they do, you know, would be able to offer a private room and say, you know, or, or, you know, we can, we can do this if we need to take it off. Uh, cause again, I don't know how turbans are held together. I guess there's a pin in there that kind of holds everything together. And that might be what's setting off the metal detectors. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I don't. Does anyone, maybe so, one of our readers knows more about turbans and and how all this fits. Um, let us know because uh, this is this is an area that's kind of outside of our uh, you know day to day realm. Lutherans don't wear them. We drink coffee. Yeah. Um, yeah, and <laughs> we don't have a lot of Sikhs in Iowa. So uh, at least not in, in my neck of the woods. So you can let There's us. Quite a few Muslims. Okay. You can contact us at, what's the phone number again? 206-350-4749. Or you can click on the screen, and that'll take you, if you're watching this on iTunes, that'll take you right to the um, feedback page. Or you can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yes, and you can let us know what's going on. So, especially if you got some cool. more background on this, that, that, that would be interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. But one thing you won't see on this show is Jim and me practicing yoga. You won't see me eating yogurt. You'll see me listening to <laughs> yo- doing impressions of Yogi Bear. A hey, boo boo. Uh, but not <laughs> yoga. And uh, you have uh, this is in uh, London. London. The Britons. Ooh, the Britons. Or no, I'm in uh, Taunton, Somerset. Sorry. Okay. Two stories from London, but um, you have uh, Silver Street Baptist Church and St. James Church of England, and there was a yoga class for children, and the pastors at these churches said, uh, no, you, you can't be having yoga classes at our church. Uh, apparently, they were renting out the hall or, you know, something like that. And they said, ah, uh, nope, sorry, we draw the line with that. Right, said, uh, they, they said it's a sham and unchristian. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. And uh, Louise Woodstock, who's uh, running the class, was very upset. She said, I couldn't believe it when they suddenly said I couldn't have the hall anymore because yoga is against their Christian, their Christian ethos. It's crazy because we're talking about kids pretending to be animals and doing exercise routines to rhymes. The churches are being narrow-minded. I explained to the church that my yoga is completely non-religious activity. There's no dogma involved. I got a bad feeling about this. 
And yet, um, you know, they argue, on the other hand, the philosophy of yoga cannot be separ- separated from the practice of it. And any teacher of yoga must subscribe to its philosophy. As Christians, we believe I mean, this philosophy is false and not something we wish to encourage. Although... This is sort of like saying we're just, um, you know, we're doing uh, uh, Holy Communion, um, but we're not, we're doing a non-religious Holy Communion. Uh, well, I don't know, okay? I mean... Um, first off, um, I've heard of Christian yoga, you know, where they, 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 uh, actually from what I was, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you know, that in, in yoga is done in, in, in some public schools and, you know, but it's, it's more of a, a breathing thing than actually, you know, and stuff than considered a, a religious meditation. I mean, it's kind of like the question of martial arts. You know, my son is a black belt in judo and um, a brown belt in karate. You know, and it used to be that, you know, it was, you know, can you separate the martial arts and and, and his, you know, and learning all these these Japanese terms from, you know. The, I would say I would say it depends on, um, on which martial art you're talking about. I mean, judo is actually an American creation. And. Um, and karate, well, there's a lot of different forms of it, but um, it's a it's a hard style. Um, whereas some of the softer styles um, are much more focused on the spiritual aspect. Like aikido, for instance, is very focused on sort of focusing your chi and and that kind of stuff. It's it's you know it's very um, centered in Eastern religion and. Um, uh, Taoism, I think, um, or Buddhism. I don't know much about things Buddhism. Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean that's the question about yoga. The thing is, a lot of the sort of movements and, and breathing and stuff involved in yoga are based on that concept of sort of your personal energy, which is uh, not a Christian concept. Well, I am psychic, you know. So, uh, I I don't know. I mean, it just doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Yeah. I, again, I don't know if you can, if you can divorce the, the the exercise from the religious perspectives and stuff. I I, cause I know, um, you know, a lot of kids, even Christian kids who at that you know through their school and stuff will take a, a class in yoga. Um, a couple years ago. When I was flying to Chicago, I was flying to Pittsburgh, taking the shortcut through Chicago. Um, don't ask me why I had to fly from here to Chicago and then back to Pittsburgh. Never figured it out. That was the, and that was a cheap flight. Now I know why the airlines are going broke. But uh, I had a woman. Uh, she's sitting next to me. She had a yoga studio, and so she taught. You know, and uh, she was fascinated. Yeah, we had a really neat witnessing experience on that plane as I shared, you know, the Christian faith with her and stuff, but, um, but, you know, she talked to me a little bit about yoga and, um, you know, that she taught it and stuff, but it was kind of divorced from any kind of religious principles at all. I mean, at least, you know, nothing overt. I think that's yeah. what she was talking about too. She said, you know, it's, it was completely non-religious, and there was no dogma involved per se. It just, I mean, kind of probably kind of like the yoga class you got at the YMCA. I think it would be, um, you know, you, you kind of have to look at all right. Why are you doing these particular activities? What what makes it yoga, and not just a an exercise class? Or some kind, you know, what's the difference between yoga and aerobics? And then you have to look at, all right, what are these activities you're doing and why are you doing these activities? If it's something about, you know, balancing your personal energy or something like that, then then you're getting into the religious aspect. If it's just, well, I'm trying to improve my cardiovascular circulation or, you know, or something like that, well, then you're probably all right. So, you know, it really kind of gets to why are you doing it. I am wondering, why are you here? Uh, I'd still be nervous about a, a, you know, 
I guess if... Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. If... Why does it, if, you know, if, if it's not yoga in the sense of the Hindu practice, then do you have to call it yoga? You know, could they just call it a children's exercise thing and kind of, if it's, you know, if, if you're avoiding that whole concept, then why are you calling it yoga? Well, if, if, if you're, you know, I would say because, you know, the idea, that's what it's associated with. I mean, you know, what are, uh, uh, um, what do you call, you know, Pilates? Pilates are stretching and, and strengthening. You know, I mean, you know, even if you don't buy into uh, Dr. Pilates and, you know, some of his viewpoints on, you know, why this is a good thing, it's that, you know, you go through this, you know, and the, you know, I'd say with the yoga, the, the stretching, the, the movements and things like that, that this is, this is what it is, whether or not you actually buy into the religious aspect of it or not. Um, so, um, I don't know. I, I, I would be, uh, I, I, again, this is something I don't know enough about. And so, but I've known yoga being taught in public schools. I've known it being taught in the Y. Uh, I've known being, you know, used by uh, therapists in uh, group therapy sessions to, you know, help bring down, you know, emotions and help kids, you know, people learn to relax and gain control over their emotions and over themselves. Uh, I know with therapists and who, who have kids who cut and uh, things like that, it's uh, and and kids who are, you know, uh, coming out of drug abuse, um, they use it to help them, you know, focus and 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 as, as other things to do and and coping mechanisms. Um, but I don't think any knowing that overall a lot of therapists tend to be very irreligious. Uh, there was an article this week that said psychiatrists are the most, least religious of all physicians. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think they buy into the religious aspects of it at all, but it's something that they just find very helpful. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it, it, there's also a matter of there's certain practices that, like, you know, for instance, there's been studies done with, like, acupuncture and stuff like that and suggestions that it's, you know, it's not it's not that it's balancing your body's energy. It, it actually has to do with your your circulation, your pressure points, and, and stuff like that. And I know there's you know people on both sides of the fence as far as whether you believe in acupuncture or not. But um, you know, so you know, I, I think it really it, it kind of goes back to are you doing it because it's it's exercise, and you know, if so, why why yoga? And you know, I, I think it's important to. If nothing else, it, you know, it's a teaching opportunity to say, well, you know, what is this? And, and what uh, um, what are the, the concerns? I, I think it would be good to, to kind of sit down and, and talk with them about it and, you know, kind of discuss it instead of just slamming the door on them, in essence. Right. So, I don't know. But it's a it's it's an interesting thing to to look at and to talk about and figure out what's going on there. Yeah, but no no goats advice in there. No, no goats, no goats. So we're talking about Hindus, so now we've come full circle again. Yeah. So we've had Hindus. <laughs> Hindus become Roman Catholics. Hindus doing non-religious yoga. We, we 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 we've got it all tonight, folks. We got Sikhs with turbans. Where else would you get such quality information? Huh? But maybe you disagree with us. Maybe you need to enlighten us. Maybe we need to have more help. You can get a hold of us. Podcast at crossfeednews.com. You can contact us there. If you're watching this on iTunes, you can click on the neat little screen there and give us feedback. Or you can call us at 206-350-4749. Two, See? We know each other well enough that we can finish each other's sentences now. Is this any way to treat an intimate friend? So we thank you for for tuning in. We thank you for uh, putting up with our irregular schedule um, over the past uh, couple of weeks and that uh, for hanging around. We appreciate that. We love hearing from you. And we wish you all a very uh, blessed week. Shout out real quick to 
PDAPerformance.com, our sponsor, pays for our ban- uh, pays for our server and uh, everything else, and we're really thankful for them. Makers of very fine Palm software, yep. and uh, we do thank you for putting up with our weekly silliness. And uh, pray then that God would give you all a very good week and a very good weekend in His grace. And uh, we will see you then next week. Good night, everybody. God bless. Good night. God bless. Oh, switch off.